You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Chapter 20 Alice's Decline It was unbelievable, the wonderful sight of his home through the trees as they approached the driveway, a view which on many occasions he had thought he would never see again. The cab pulled up outside the front steps. Mark had phoned home to say they would be arriving that evening, but the traffic had been a lot worse than expected. It was a glorious evening, with the sun flickering through the tall trees, but there was no response at the front door. Around the back, he unlatched the big iron-hinged garden gate to see his Uncle David and Rosemary fast asleep on the garden chairs under the horse chestnut tree. He walked over to them. Hello? Guess who? He said in a disturbingly loud voice. David opened his eyes, blinked, and shook Rosemary by the arm as he spoke. "'Bless my soul, Mark! How are you?' he said. "'Expected you back hours ago. Must have dozed off.' Rosemary was on her feet amidst squeals of delight to see her favorite nephew home again. Jane appeared, framed in the picturesque gateway. David yelled out, "'Smile!' as he took her picture with his Polaroid. Rosemary rushed up and gave them both an enormous hug and a kiss. She was so pleased to see them. Thank goodness you arrived safely last night. We were getting rather worried when the time had got on a bit, she said, looking them both up and down, as if they'd been missing for years. You both look well, remarked David. Especially Jane, he added. Now, now, Rosemary scolded. They all laughed and sat down on the patio steps. Mark instinctively looked up towards his mother's bedroom window overlooking the garden just as dusk fell. How's dear Alice? he asked. Sounded concerned, feeling something wasn't quite right, but not knowing what. She's having a late afternoon nap, said Rosemary. She nodded off during the afternoon, so I suggested she ought to have a little rest in bed. She should be woken soon if she's not already awake. I'll go up to her room now, said Mark in an urgent tone to his voice. David exchanged glances with Rosemary as Mark pushed open the French windows and made his way to the stairs via the drawing room. His mother's door was slightly ajar, just as she always preferred it, just in case she needed to call out for something. Nearing the room, he couldn't help noticing a rather unpleasant stale smell. It came from Alice's bed, which appeared to be blotchy and stained. At first, he thought it must be caused by the patio light through the gap in the half-closed curtains, falling onto the bed, forming a pattern. But it wasn't. Mark was horrified to realize that his mother's bed had not been changed for quite some time. Mark took hold of her arm to gently shake her awake. She was breathing, but nevertheless didn't respond to his movement. Her face was partly hidden by her filthy pillow. By this time, Mark was seething with anger that his mother had been left in such an unbelievable state. Then, without any warning, Alice flicked her head so that she was face up. What he saw made his blood run cold. It was like some scene from a horror movie. Alice's face had changed beyond all recognition. The skin on her face had sunken to the bones, with her eyes also sunken into their sockets. Her lips were dry and cracked, and one corner of her mouth was bleeding with thick blood congealed on the collar of her nightgown. He fought back the nausea and realized that she hadn't been up there for just a few hours' nap. She had lain on that bed for days, perhaps weeks. He stared, terrified, as she lifted her head and made indescribable animal noises, at first in a high-pitched tone, and then ending with a hideous, deep, guttural groan. What had happened? How did he feel something was wrong when he was in the garden looking up at her window? He couldn't stop himself retching and rushed over to the window, thrusting it open for fresh air 
with Alice repeating her monstrous sounds. He looked down to the patio, but no one was sitting there. His eyes moved down to the garden. No one. Mark looked further to the summer house, appearing ghostly illuminated by the distant patio light. There they were, David, Rosemary, and Jane. Jane was holding her head in her hands as she looked up to see Mark at the window. What's happened to her? he shouted. Come at me here at once, he ordered. Rosemary, you! He moved away from the window and back towards the bed. After a while, David, not Rosemary, stood in the doorway. He found it hard to speak, resting his head on the doorframe. What is wrong with her, David? God in heaven, answer me, man! She is... She is completely insane, David said slowly and clearly, for he didn't wish to repeat it. She barely eats or drinks anything we bring her. God knows we've tried. She can't last much longer. He choked at the stench. What do you mean, much longer? How long has she been up there like this? Mark demanded. Nearly two weeks, David admitted. I cannot believe you. Why? We thought she might get better, snap out of it or, or something. We're as shocked as you are, David tried to explain. Oh, no, you're not. This is terrible. Why didn't you contact me in the States? Because it would have served no purpose. Alice would still be in this condition, whether you knew it or not. We discussed what we should do right after we called the doctor, and we decided it would be better for you not to know, not until... Your important mission was over. It would have severely held you up. You wouldn't have been able to carry on. As it is, your plan succeeded, Jane tells us. We told her all about it while you were discovering for yourself. There was nothing you could have done here. David had dreaded this moment, but Mark was calmer now and standing at the window again. There followed a long silence as both men tried to come to terms with the reality of the situation. Alice was now lying half out of her bed, sniveling and groaning in a deep voice, much deeper than a man's normal voice. When did it start, David? About two weeks after you left for the States. At first, she wouldn't leave her room, and then later, she wouldn't allow anyone in the room at all. She would spit and claw. Both of us have lumps of skin pulled away. They seem to be healing now. She became uncontrollable, and her voice changed dramatically, continued Dave. The doctor came over on several occasions. There was nothing he could do. Only sent her to some mental hospital. Would you have wanted that, Mark? No, no, of course not. I understand your dilemma now, but it was a terrible shock. Terrible. I simply don't know what to do. He looked up at David's face. I'm sorry. I'm glad you realized the problem. You see, we expected you back much sooner to make a decision before she was hospitalized. Mark slowly shook his head in despair. David continued to say how one morning Alice was nowhere to be found in the house. She was eventually discovered in the summer house, unconscious, and he and Rosemary had carried her to her room, where she then remained. It wasn't until late that night that Mark and Jane unpacked their cases. Mark just stood around in the bedroom and hallway. He just couldn't come to terms with his mother's awful state. On three other occasions that night, he went to Alice's bedside, hardly able to keep himself from gagging at the stench which assailed his nostrils. He tried to change her bedding and get her to talk to him, at least so that he knew she recognized him. All he got on waking her was a stream of spitting abuse. On the last occasion, he knew it was futile, and she was far too gone. The whole homecoming was turned into a nightmare by Alice's condition. All four of them walked the house almost in total silence. There really was nothing to talk about. David stayed the night as he had done since it became obvious that Rosemary wouldn't be able to cope with Alice on her own. Mark spoke to their family GP, a Dr. Jessup, 
late in the evening, who told him about as much as David had revealed. His advice was that she should be taken into care immediately, as she was in serious danger if she couldn't keep her food or drink down. This he had told David the day before. There was nothing else anyone in the household could do, and so the next day arrangements were made for Alice to be taken to a psychiatric geriatric ward to the south of the city. No verbal contact was possible, as Alice was driven away in an ambulance with Mark beside her, leaving her beloved house and garden never to return to the summer house. She died three days later. When the shock of it all had subsided, the four of them attended to Alice's bedroom. The cleaning-up procedure was an arduous task, with much of the bedding, carpet, and rugs in such a bad state they had to be burnt. A massive writing desk and bookcase remained as the last task to be undertaken in the bedroom. Hours of sorting through old papers, envelopes, letters, and all manner of correspondence, with the difficult decisions as to what to keep and what to dispose of. All the photographs were kept, as well as dozens of personal letters to Alice. These letters were to prove the key to her decline into insanity. The personal letters, as they were in fact labeled, had all been resealed after being opened and presumably read. Wide strips of cracked brown gummed paper bordered the edges of the envelopes, with other pieces gummed over the front and back in a crisscross pattern. The decision had to be made as to whether they were to be kept unopened or simply destroyed or opened and read, even after her death. They were still her property to be respected. But one very important reason was evidently in favor of them being opened and read by the family. Something had caused Alice's health to decline, and a clue may become evident in the contents of these letters. Some of the letters were replies to those she had written to her many friends and relatives. These were not taped up. It was the letters secured with tape which held the answer. It transpired that Alice had been conducting an affair with the husband of one of her best friends well over thirty years ago. The obsessive manner in which the envelopes were resealed suggested that no one else should read them, yet she was obviously compelled to keep them rather than destroy them. The letters revealed the sadness of the affair. Their secret had to be kept. It couldn't be allowed to become common knowledge, especially in the high-society lifestyle in which they were involved. Alice had known the gentleman before she married, but although she loved her husband dearly, she was a terrible flirt, especially at the many functions she either attended or gave at the big Hampstead house. Mark's Uncle David knew all about it, but had sworn to Alice never to reveal his sister's affair. He had no intention of doing so anyway. He knew of their secret meetings in the summer house, a splendid place. In its wild state today, it certainly had its own special charm and magnetism, despite its hastening dereliction. The letters slowly built up into a love story worthy of any classic book or epic film. They had both suffered the most terrible guilt and mental stress, only living for the next time they could be alone in the relative seclusion of the summer house. It was later revealed in a recently hidden letter at the back of the desk that the now old gentleman had died whilst Mark was away in the States with Jane. The discovery of his death had an utterly profound effect on Alice, and her already deteriorating health went into a hopeless decline. The final turning point came when she took it upon herself to reach the summer house, just as if she needed to recall those magical moments from all those long years ago. If she did recall them, or had failed to, either outcome propelled her to insanity and death. David filled in most of the details the letters failed to divulge, as Alice had confided in David with the problems which faced her. She had total trust in him, and it was only now, after her death, that David felt the others should know about the reason for her condition and inevitable death. He had only been shown a few of the love letters by Alice in confidence, and knew nothing of the taping up until now. 
but Alice had shown him the letter containing the newspaper cutting of her lover's obituary. Many, but by no means all, of Alice's friends attended the cremation, along with most of the remaining family. The family solicitor contacted Mark about the creation and told him that his mother had prepared a will when she was quite sane and had left everything to him. This came as no surprise, because John had not returned from Australia for his father's funeral, nor, as it turned out, for his mother's cremation. He was wealthy and successful, and had obviously cut himself off from the family. Mark was always Alice's favorite, even though he loathed their lifestyle, but had never spoken or acted in any obvious way against it. However, David was well aware of his views. When all that could be done at the house was completed, David and Rosemary returned to their home. They had done more than enough. They were told they were always welcome at the house any time, as if it was an extension of their own home. There was no way Mark could ever properly repay them. The house was now his, and everything contained within it. It was difficult for him to comprehend all that had taken place during the past few months, not only all that was involved in the summer house project, but also the sudden changes he and Jane were subjected to. They organized the house as best they could for their immediate needs and began to think about returning to work in Cambridge. One Friday evening the telephone rang, as it had done countless times over the last month. Mark picked up the phone. Hello? He greeted the caller with a sort of lively sing-song. Hello, is this the number of Dr. Mark Granger? said a delightfully feminine voice. Oh, it certainly is. Can I help you? replied Mark. It's Natasha, do you remember, from the hospital? As if Mark needed reminding. He yelled down the hallway to Jane. It's Natasha, Jane, on the phone. He gathered his wits. Natasha, it's wonderful to hear from you. Wonderful. What's been happening over there? Are you well? He managed to blurt out in his excitement. Yes, sir, I'm fine. Everyone has been so wonderful I can hardly believe it, she continued. Well, that's great to hear, Natasha. You offered me accommodation in your home until I can find a place of my own. I don't wish to be a burden, but is the offer still on? Oh, you couldn't be a burden if you tried. Can you really come over? By now Jane was sharing the telephone earpiece with Mark. I must be brief. I cannot afford to speak for too long. I can come over to England to work. Isn't that marvelous, Mark? Terrific! That's really great news! Go on, prompted Mark, knowing it would be a very expensive telephone call. I will tell you all about it if I can come over. What do you think? And, Jane, will it really be possible for me to do this? Her excitement was bordering on a plea for sanctuary. Natasha! Don't spend any more of your money on this call. Just let us know if you need a definite job to come to when you arrive, and we'll soon fix that up for you. It won't be a problem. Otherwise, we'll need to know when you're arriving, and we'll pick you up at the airport, okay? Are you sure you're all right for money? If not, let us know. I've just been left in an enormous house and garden, together with a substantial sum of money, so if you're in financial difficulties, I'll be furious if I find out, okay? Thank you, Mark. You are such kind people. Goodbye, and love to Jane. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Looking forward to seeing you. Mark put the phone back on the rest and looked at Jane. It's not fantastic news. Did you manage to catch any of that? Oh, it's terrific news. It's all worked out perfectly for her. We're sure to get Natasha a job at the hospital, but that would mean commuting from London every day, and there's a flat we're still paying for. What should we do about that? We could always buy a place in Cambridge until Natasha finds a place of her own. I don't mean a large house instead of this one. I could never give this up. It's too special. Mark glanced into the garden as he said it, his eyes settling on the venerable, enigmatic summer house. <laughs>